Welcome to The Edges of Lean. I'm Bella Engelbach, and in this podcast, we explore the human and creative side of lean thinking, unusual places where lean thinking is practiced. We meet people who are practicing continuous improvement in many different flavors and styles. So come along with me on a journey to the edges of lean. Episode 73, Continuous Improvement and Finding Meaning at Work with Kevin Herring. Kevin Herring specializes in business turnarounds, helping organizations create high-performing teams. His interest in how humans thrive in a workplace started all the way back in college, not in a class, but at a summer job. It's an amazing story. Let's hear him tell it. Kevin Herring, welcome to the Edges of Lean. Hi, well, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Kevin, I'm very excited about what we're going to talk about today because it is, you know, one of my absolutely favorite things to talk about, which is culture and the relationship of culture to an organization that is able to improve. And um, what you'd really like to talk about, which is organizations, you know, just not just improving, but really turning around their performance. So Mm -hmm. um, to get started, tell us about Kevin, um, a little bit about your life and what you're doing now. Yeah, appreciate that. So I had kind of an interesting path. Um, you know, I, I think that when I was going into college, I really wasn't sure what I wanted to do, but I knew I was interested in business and I knew that I was interested in working with people and I didn't quite know how to connect the two. And I had an interesting experience um, that sort of led me into the field that I eventually went into. Um, I worked for an accidental self-directed work team. And so this was a summer job uh, as I was just starting college, I had a summer job and, and it was with a, it was on an assembly line of all things for a food dehydrator manufacturing company. And absolutely the most boring job I think you could imagine. <laughs> it was pretty rough, but, but there were some interesting things about it. The, the, it was a large building with front offices across the front and and, uh, and there was a door from the front offices into the rest of the building where the assembly line was. And so my first day at work, they someone from the front office took me through that door into the assembly line area and um, introduced me to somebody on the line and said, can you kind of show Kevin the ropes? And I said, and they said, sure, you know, I'll, we'll kind of show him what he needs to do. And said, okay. And there's no supervisor, no manager in sight. So um, he showed me what I needed to do, kind of explained to me that you know he, he would train me and as I got to learn things, I could do other things and that sort of thing. Anyway, I never met the manager probably for the first week or two I was there, never saw him. And uh, when he finally came up and introduced himself, you know, he said, welcome and all that kind of thing. But he said, you probably won't see a lot of me because I'm back working in the warehouse, have other responsibilities. So I asked the guy I was working with to tell me a little bit about that. I said, is, is he ever around? He said, no, we never see him. <laughs> so this team just functioned on their own, right? And um, an interesting thing about it, you know, they would rotate, someone got bored, they, they swapped with somebody else. When someone was behind and they were ahead, they moved to a different position to help that person. All those things just happened naturally. But here's the interesting thing. There was a, a board, the, the U-shape faced the, the wall to the front office, and in the front office, there was a board at the top of the, uh, up, uh, up toward the top of the, the wall, um, and it said, today's goal, and there was a number written up there, and I asked the guy I was working with, what, what's with the number, um, and he said, oh, somebody put that up a couple of weeks ago. I said, somebody? Like who? He said, just somebody on the line. I said, anybody? He said, Yeah. Why would they put that up there? Um, just to make it interesting. Anyway, to cut the story a little bit short, I'll just tell you, we reached that goal. And another week late went by and somebody else put another number up there. And we reached that goal. And we continued through the whole summer reaching uh, new productivity goals, you know, uh, levels, just week after week, month after month. It was fascinating, all on our own. You know, at the end of the day, we all kind of gave a woohoo, and, uh, and that was it. Nobody in the front wow. office, right? Nobody in the front office, to my knowledge, ever knew we were doing that. 
And certainly the manager had no clue because he was never there. This just happened in this group. Isn't it fascinating? And that is that is amazing. And I'm just thinking about uh, in a project that I did um, at a previous company. Well, where, where, I mean, we worked so hard, Kevin, to get that self-directed team to be what? self-directed. Right now, we, it was a little bit more difficult because people were actually in different locations and they were doing work that um, you know was on the computer. But you know, we had to give them ways mm -hmm. to see each other and and share the work and yeah. everything. But yeah. I remember how excited they were when they figured out that, like you said, if somebody was bored or they were overwhelmed they could switch the work around mm -hmm. and how, I mean they were just so thrilled but it was it was so different from the way they had previously been working or been told to work which was the boss told them exactly what to do and they had these very rigid job descriptions and roles and responsibilities and I do my stuff and you do your stuff and they didn't you know nobody ever thought about working together it was such hard work together but what you're saying is you were in this uh as you say accidental environment yeah where the team just came together started behaving like mm -hmm. a a self-directed team uh, i mean no nobody had an mba right nobody nobody yeah. had been to toyota and said this is what you're supposed to do exactly. it, yeah. it just happened yeah, yeah. and i also want to i also want to ask you about about kind of the sense of that number and what it meant to like were people really happy when when the the number was achieved it was like you were out playing touch football and and you scored a, yeah. you scored a goal and now it, let's let's try for another one absolutely it was funny because during the day nobody said anything about it until we got close to lunchtime and then somebody at one end of the line would call out to the in, the other end of the line and say how many units and at the end of the line they would throw out a number and uh, kind of report where we were well that happened a couple times before lunch after lunch, we all went back to work and nobody said anything until about mid afternoon. And then the call started coming again. How many units? You know, they'd call back a number. And as we got closer and closer to the end of the day, the call outs became more frequent. You know, people were getting excited about it. And uh, right. So it was just it was fascinating. It was a lot of fun uh, and it was fascinating and it made a really boring job uh, very tolerable. You know, it uh, it was great. And then another number, a higher number, went up on the board maybe a week later. <laughs> and and you achieved that too. We did. So here you are. So here you are, this 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 college kid, not quite sure, I guess, what you want to be when you grow up. Mm -hmm. You know, working the summer job because you gotta work the summer job. So what what happened inside your head as you were as you were in there hearing that and being part of that and being, you know, being part of the the group of folks who were going, yay, we made it. I'll give you the first part of the rest of the story in a minute, but but I started seeing the connections between uh -huh. people's ability to control the environment and uh, and to do things that came natural for them, and that is wanting to find some meaning at work, want to have some sense of satisfaction in what they accomplished each day, even though what they were doing was horribly boring. You know, they did whatever they could to make it meaningful for them because nobody wants to spend eight plus hours a day in an environment that's just totally miserable and meaningless, right? And so they filled the void themselves because it was a natural thing to do. So I noticed that. The next thing that I noticed that was interesting is that at the end of the summer, I left to do fun things like get married, go back to school, things like that. But, um, but at the end of the summer, um, the rumor was the owner's hired somebody they owed a favor to anyway he came into the uh into the assembly line assembly area and his responsibility we were told was to raise productivity of all things now we had already increased productivity probably 30 percent at the time i was there and uh but he was going to increase productivity and i can tell you the first things that he did was he started uh he 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 brought his own rule. He said, you're no longer allowed to switch places with anyone else. Everybody has to stand on their own and keep up. Um, there's no teamwork, no speaking on the line. So that calling out back and forth had to end. Um, and nobody puts a goal up except him. He put the goal up and he would put a goal up every single day. And it was an outrageous goal every single day. And you could see how 
in just the short time I was there after he started, how the tide turned, right? The culture shifted dramatically. It went from what I describe as a commitment culture to a compliance culture where we'll do only what we have to do to keep our jobs, right? And, and I saw that, that clicked for me. I mean, I saw it happen firsthand and I knew that's what I wanna do. I wanna go into businesses and I wanna make great places to work where people can be productive and where, uh, in, in, where companies can excel in their performance because of the kind of culture that they've created. I knew that's what I wanted to do. And so that, that took me into the field industrial organizational psychology as an undergrad, and then uh, I went to University of Illinois and studied organizational behavior. Um, there, there's a little story behind that, too. I took most of my classes from the business school, and you had the ability to do that. You could take, they had an agreement with other colleges that we could take other classes outside of our own college toward and have them count toward our degree. Um, but I was always getting called in by um, uh, I can't think of her title, but she was like an academic um, dean or like a sorts dean or something. In college, yeah. And she was always calling me in, saying, "Why are you taking all these classes from the business school? Most of your classes are are from the business school. Why don't you just go to the business school?" And I said, "Well, I don't want to be an accountant. That's why." <laughs> <laughs> but uh, she, I said, "But according to what I've read, that that's okay. We can do that." And she said, "Yeah, but it's never been done like you're doing it." <laughs> I said, "Well, maybe it should." Well, you know, that was a long time ago, but things yeah. have changed, right? Now, now there is an expectation that those programs are integrated. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. Yeah. And, and, courses the, and Yeah, if you don't understand the business, how can you how can you help shape the culture to support what the business needs? And the, and the other way around. So this is oh. so pertinent right now, Kevin, because there's, there's all this talk about quiet quitting. Yeah, so mm -hmm. quiet quitting, for those of you who haven't heard about it, is the idea that you're not going to quit your job, right? You need the job, you need to pay the rent. But what you're going to do is you're going to do go in and do exactly what they tell you to do. Follow all the rules. You're not going to put in any extra effort. You're not going to you know, put in any of your ideas. You're just going to go into work, get the work done and go home, live your, live your life because life is happening outside of work. Mm -hmm. And so... You know, there's, there, there's this sort of, um, there's a moral argument that's going on about that. Should companies be expecting people to, quote, go above and beyond? Is that mm -hmm. fair? But I think the argument is also about wh why do we have these rules? You know, what are the rules actually doing for us? And do we understand the impact of the rules on the, on the environment, right? So, so uh, and as for those of us who are working with organizations that want to improve, that want to, you know, want to get better, um, I think, you know, sometimes what people want to do immediately is, that, well, let's make some more rules. You know, let's yeah, let's put yeah. some more, you know, let's 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 have more no's on the sign. Know this, know that, know the next thing, because that's how we think we're going to, you know, get that productivity. Mm -hmm. So this is, I just this, I just. As we go on, I just want everyone to realize this is really pertinent right now. This is this is a, a big conversation Absolutely. that's happening. Yeah. So um, a couple of my favorite professors, uh, Kim Cameron and Dave Wetton, uh, did some research and they found that demotivation is a learned response. Right? Demotivation is a learned response. And I think that's important to understand because when you think about any time we take a new job, we leave one job to go to another especially if we go to another company, we have high expectations, right? We expect that we're gonna have everything we need to, to do the work, we're going to be challenged, we're gonna have opportunities to grow, we're gonna be supported by our boss. Uh, it's it's gonna be a, a great experience. And little by little, we those when those expectations are, are not met, right? What happens to us? We start to get sour on the experience, right? We start to become demotivated, and um, and that's that's what happens when people go to an organization where the culture is not a fit, and the 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 culture is 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 controlled largely by the manager, right? Because culture is really all about the uh, the work experience, and and 
who controls that work experience more than anybody? You know, it's the manager. And so people often say that people leave a manager, not a, not a job. And mm -hmm. in, a, in a sense, I think that's true. I mean, sometimes it's the individual at a personal level is just not somebody who's easy to work with, but on a broader level, it's the culture that that person creates that makes it intolerable. And when people come to work and they're demotivated, they're frustrated, they have a bad experience, they don't realize any sense of meaning and purpose at work, it doesn't take long for them to want to change that situation if they can. And so it doesn't take much, a little, leave for a little more money, right? Just a little more money was all it, it may take or a chain of, change in scenery or right. just the possibility of a better experience, right? Right, a more flexible schedule or, or a shorter commute or- Exactly, yeah. it doesn't take yeah. much, yeah. Yeah. And I think that's what we're seeing, the quiet quitting, is that's, that's people speaking with their feet, in a sense, by taking the hike. They're just saying, it's, this is not what I want. I don't feel good about my experience, and I want to have a better one. So I'm going to go right. where I can get it, or where I hope yeah. I can get it, right? Right, right. Or, or maybe I'm not actually going to leave, but I'm, my head's not going to be here, right? Yeah, my head's exactly, going to be right? somewhere else. I'm going to disengage, right? Right. Because it's yeah. too emotionally draining. It's too emotionally draining when you come to work and you put your best self out there and, and the people are trying hard to do a good job and they just get hit frustration after frustration. They're just having a miserable experience and pretty soon they just don't have the energy for it anymore and they give up. Right. Yeah. 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 There's a there's terminology that they use in the disability community about spoons you know you only have some so many spoonfuls of energy in mm -hmm. a day and um you can go through your spoons pretty quickly in yeah. that kind of environment you know by lunchtime you're out so right you know. exactly <laughs> you're done it's a good so kevin, kevin can you define for us because you use these words and, and this is what you know what you you studied in for undergraduate and both gra and graduate organizational psychology and organizational behavior. So I think you know we understand individual psychology, right? Mm -hmm. People how how people um, think and believe and and how how they behave and you know probably you know we probably don't understand it anywhere as well as we should, but you know we see that in individuals. Um, so what is organizational psychology then? It's, it's really about how do we create the best experience for individuals in the workplace um, in a way that helps them bring their best selves to work and to work each day and to produce their best work in a way that benefits the business and helps the business to succeed. To me, that's what it's about. Um, if we're able to create a culture and environment uh, that uh, stimulates creativity, engagement, commitment, uh, then we give people an opportunity to feel more sense, uh, more of a sense of meaning and purpose at work. And in the process of doing that, the business will benefit and become more profitable. And there's plenty of research to support that, right? But that's, uh, to me, that's the, that's what the field is all about. So it's 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 about that the the so the shared beliefs so the shared um, you know the things that are said and unsaid about about how we operate in this particular environment is that right? right. Yeah. So so we're starting starting to talk again about culture and that notion that that culture is comprised of the the. Um, the experiences that we have as individuals when we come to work. You know, what are the rules? What are the mores? What are the resources? How do we get treated? How do we feel? Um, all those types of things uh, shape the culture. And, and then how we respond to it also has a big impact on the, how we shape that culture, right? As individuals, we, we do that. But the person that has the most impact on all of those is the manager. So the management practices play a huge role in creating that environment that we then respond to. Now, sure, we have a choice. We could respond positively to a negative uh, situation, and, and sometimes we do, right? Sometimes we do. But, but most people, and in most circumstances, we don't, right? It, those, those negative leadership practices 
centered around authoritarianism, compliance, and so on. Those kinds of things wear on us as individuals. Plenty of research shows that it helps to demotivate us, and, uh, and we typically don't respond well to that over time. So I think that's kind of the, the issue is how, if, we want, if we want people to be their best, to be committed, to choose accountability, not just be held accountable, which is a compliance mentality, right? That's a yeah. practice, but to create an environment, create the conditions where Kevin comes to work and Kevin's excited to be there. Even if he's making crackers at a cracker factory, Kevin <laughs> has a sense of meaning because, or food dehydrators as the case may be, uh, Kevin has a sense of purpose in what he's doing each day. And you can live, leave at the end of each day feeling satisfied that he's contributed at a meaningful level and accomplished something that's substantial. You know, that's important for people to experience on a daily basis. Uh, makes a huge difference because now I have, with the conditions are there for that, I can make choices about how I will engage. You know, we like to think managers, in fact, we tell managers sometimes that they're in charge of it, an individual's engagement, you know, their morale, their commitment. Well, that's ridiculous. They can't control anybody's but their own. Uh, but what they can do is create conditions that enable or encourage people, make people want to choose a higher level of commitment and accountability and therefore engagement, right? So culture is, is so heavily influenced by, by our managers it, uh, and our leaders. It's, it, it behooves us to want to do a better job of, of building great leaders in our organizations, right? I mean, it's just... That's, that's what's lacking so much uh, in our organizations. We talk about um, trying to raise performance or to create lean organizations or to do things that help us to have better quality and continuous improvement and things like that. But how do we do that when we have a culture of compliance, right? A culture that's demotivating for people. Why would anyone want to adopt those new ideas? You know, it's, it's pretty difficult for anybody to feel they want to engage in, in something to help the company to be better uh, in their performance when it's horrible in its culture. Right, right, right. So so I'm I'm thinking about you know contrasting these two situations that you were in very, very early in your career, you know, this formative experience that you had in the food dehydrator factory. Mm -hmm. So on one end, you have the self-directed team with a manager who I guess was not all that visible, but by the lack of visibility said, I trust you. Yep. I believe you can get the job done. You figure it out. Mm -hmm. Right. And on the other end, you have the manager who comes in and says, I have all the answers and these are all the rules and follow all, follow all the rules. And that's how we're going to increase productivity. So, for I think for most people that we would agree that you know in a lot of situations the almost invisible manager is a, is probably not the best answer right I mean that was a very that was a wonderful uh, fortuitous situation yeah right um, that you were that you were in a, that you were in with a group of people when no one was going to sort of take the reins and say I'm going to be the boss now and mm -hmm. and then become that person who is setting the rules right um, uh, so. We're talking about if there was a dial from zero to a hundred. We're talking about about you know something that's in between zero and a and a and a hundred, right? That's right. That would be at least how you would want to start. Mm -hmm. Right, right. So, he, he, you know, here's the thing that I see all the time, and I know you see it too, Kevin, is that people move into management, into leadership, because they are technically proficient. Yeah. Right. right. And we I've, we've, I've talked before on this podcast and had guests who talked before about what's happening in education, where education is not helping people who are the future leaders learn to lead. You know, they're learning technical things, whether it's accounting or you know, biochemistry or, or engineering, they're learning how to be good technicians, but they're not learning about how 
to 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 lead people. So if you have somebody who's like that, they're starting out, they just became a team leader, they just became a first level supervisor, maybe they've been on the on the line in a plant and now they've been promoted to supervisor and they're, you know, they're super excited. They are that person. The first day of the job, I'm so excited. Yep. I'm going to be the best manager ever. What what should they be doing, thinking about, and what should their manager be doing for them in those first few weeks? Boy, um, that's a great question. I think there, there are a number of things that are critical here. One is it's important for people to see themselves as a business person first and not the technical person that they are when they come to work. So for instance, you know, if, if I'm a supply chain uh, professional or I'm a computer programmer by trade or whatever it is, an accountant, that I don't think of myself as an accountant who happens to work at XYZ company. And I could be an accountant in any of a dozen companies, but they think of themselves as an XYZ business person who happens to bring accounting expertise to the organization, but their focus is not on just accounting. Their, their bigger focus, their broader focus is on making the business successful. So they're thinking as a business person, an XYZ business person first and foremost, and then leveraging their expertise uh, as they need to, to, to help the business succeed. And, and I think that's a mindset that it's important for every person to to, to consider when you're starting out, think of yourself as a business person and what can you do to help build that business? Uh, the other thing I, I would suggest is that the, having an orientation toward the success of the whole, which, which is sort of a corollary to that, right? If, if we, if we in, instead of focusing just on our own careers or what we need to accomplish or want to accomplish with our teams and that sort of thing, we think what's in the interest of the whole? What can I do to help my team department, business unit, the, the, the greater organization to succeed so that, so that we're not getting into turf battles between teams and departments and over who gets to use the copy machine or the forklift and, and, and that sort of thing, right? Um, but we see ourselves as part of a whole and we, and we behave that way. Um, and then the, the other thing I think that's a supportive of that is if we're going to build a team of people committed to the success of the whole, then we have to put them first. We have to put people and people needs first. If we do what's right for people in the interest of the business, we will do what's right for the customer in the business, right? And I think that's, that's paramount, that we focus on, on building the capacity of each individual and each team to contribute to the business. And we build their capacity by doing a variety of things, by teaching them the big picture, the context of the organization and the marketplace, their connection to it, how they influence and impact each other in the business, all those sorts of things. You know, sharing uh, control over the methods and the means of the work and and um, in doing things, managing or leading in a way that engages people to uh, own their own commitment right, to their own commitment to the success of the business and to each other. I think those are things that I would put out there uh, right up front and help people to kind of have a new orientation to their workplace, because that's something that they generally don't experience at work, but it'll make a huge difference in their career. Yeah, because then what you're talking about is is everybody getting more of the big picture that enables them wherever they are to be you know bring that view um, into every situation that they're in and right. and to and probably make you know I would say probably definitely make better decisions because mm -hmm. you're going to make decisions about the whole or, or that affect the whole versus decisions that affect my group my department my or me, you know, or me, <laughs> right, <laughs> right, yeah. yeah, yeah. So let's go back and talk about a little bit about purpose. Um, so, in the food dehydrated plan, was the purpose linked to the number? Was it linked to this feeling of success you had when you were all working together? Where were you getting that purpose from? It's a great question. Um, I think that um, 
you know, I felt like while I was there, I was sort of like a fly on the wall, kind of in observer mode most of the time, yeah. trying to understand what was happening. It was fascinating. It was actually a fascinating study. But, but yeah, what what created the purpose? And I honestly believe that um, it was that self motivation, that engagement, that people are naturally intrinsically motivated to do something, to create something bigger than themselves. I think people tend to gravitate that way naturally. They tend to want to do a good job. They want to accomplish something meaningful. And I think that's where a lot of leaders really struggle is that mm. it's, and I call it stance. It's, it's, a, it's a stance that people have about, that managers have about people. And they can either have a stance that's all about people are typically lazy, untrustworthy, have to be watched and, and controlled and all that kind of thing. Or they have a stance that's more trusting and that they feel like people are generally trustworthy and most self-motivated and that sort of thing. And that stance drives how we, uh, our intentions and how we deal with people and the practices that result from those intentions. And so when we go to this, uh, this food dehydrator factory, um, I, you know, I look at what, you know, what was driving that, you know, well, is, as you pointed out, the manager obviously had some level of trust that was extended, whether it was overt or, mm -hmm. subtle, you know, just assumed, I think, but people felt empowered. Nobody told them they were empowered to my knowledge, but they felt empowered and they just naturally wanted to follow their normal inclinations to want to do a good job. And then to, to keep it interesting and challenging so that they could grow and, and have, uh, have a great experience, then they, they engaged at a higher level and they set a goal to make it uh, easier for everybody to sort of join together. And I think it's just a natural evolution of things that may not happen in every team, but it doesn't really take that much to get a team functioning that way. It, it really doesn't. A good leader can do that very easily. Right. Um, well, uh, yeah. So I've seen good leaders do that actually just by sometimes being quiet, right? Yeah. And yeah. like an, another five minutes of not saying anything and letting people, you know, go at it, work on the problem, um, and not not weighing in themselves. I mean, I, I, so you know, that's a little bit like you know, like big out in the yeah. warehouse. I'm not even going to be there, you know. But yeah, General but, Electric did something. They had what they call workout sessions, and and. Uh, the uh, and the, the supervisor was not allowed to be in the room with the team. The team got to go through and and analyze the work and and uh, come up with things that that need to be done to improve how they did the work and and so on. And when they were ready, then the supervisor was brought in, and the supervisor had to just sit there and listen. wasn't allowed to say anything. And it's that it, 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 that silence, right? That says we value what you have to say. We're going to listen to it. We're not going to comment on it. We're not going to criticize it. We're not going to judge it. We're just going to listen to it. We're going to hear you like we haven't heard you in the past. And that empowered people. And people were energized around that. And that was a very successful program. Yeah. Yeah. So so what else can, can leaders do to 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 demonstrate that that stance of I really believe that you are intrinsically motivated. I really believe that you yeah. are capable. One is how you extend trust. And I think that as a leader, uh, whenever you're in a, you're having team meetings, if you're having regular team meetings, you're talking about decisions that have been made or need to be made, changes in how the work gets done, how to address problems and so on. And when that happens, how the leader conducts his, him or herself uh, makes, makes a huge difference. So, um, so some leaders feel like they can't show any vulnerabilities whatsoever. They can't show any uncertainty. They just have to make decisions boldly and, um, and declare those, those decisions to the workplace, to the workforce, and tell them to go out and execute. And, uh, you know, in contrast, if you have a leader that's willing to, to share their um, ideas, share their concerns, you know, even if it's a mandate from above, if they can, if they're human enough about it to share their concerns and say, okay, I know this is a challenging thing for us to do. We're asked to do something that we haven't figured out yet. Uh, and I have concerns about how well we're going to do that, but it's something we need to do, right? So being vulnerable, saying, I have concerns too, just like you do. 
right? But but somehow we've got to pull together and we have to figure this out. And it's a we, it's not a me, right? We have to figure this out. So they, they become inclusive. And when people raise questions about a decision, first of all, they've got to be in a safe place to do that or they won't raise them. Yeah. Right. right? I mean, how many times have, have you been in uh, these meetings where they have a, uh, an opportunity for you to a skip level meeting where you have an opportunity to talk to the two levels up, you know, and, and, and uh, all you can hear are crickets. Nobody says nope. anything, right? They Nobody wants to say a word. No one wants to be the first person right? to say anything. It's a culture yeah. of fear. And if you have a culture of fear, you're never going to get engagement. You're never going to get participation like you need it. So, so the, so the, as, as Deming used to say, you have to drive fear out of the organization. And you do that by being vulnerable. You do that by being willing to share decision-making, changing your mind in front of the group and saying, based on the information you shared with me, um, it sounds like maybe we need to go a different direction. Maybe I made a mistake. Let's, you know, let's talk about that. And then being willing to change direction when it makes sense to do that based on the evidence that's coming from, from the team. So I think, you know, being willing to do that, to share um, power with the team doesn't diminish the leader's power. It actually increases it because now there are more people in uh, who are committed to the success of the team in the organization. There are more people who are who are being accountable for that, not just one person, right? So it actually increases the accountability. It increases the power that's there to help strengthen the the results of the team. So I think those are some things that you know that that a leader can do. Be vulnerable, share information, not on a quote need to know basis. And mm -hmm. poor employees don't need to know, right? You, you've got to be willing to share power with the organization, the information, the big picture. Uh, take them out and take a field trip and show them the organization and who does what. You know, if you're working remote, get uh, get people on the on a camera in front of the screen and uh, see what how the rest of the organization operates and who does what and who needs what from whom and and help them to find out what their connections are how they're affecting the work of other people and think in terms of service you know how can we serve others in the organization and what can i do to help you to to do what you need to do for the customer and uh you know, help me to know what that is instead of me demanding from you what I want from you, but actually thinking in terms of serving each other in the interest of the whole. Um, you know, those how, are, right? How can I help you? What what yeah. what can I do to help? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So so leaders have a huge responsibility to to build that in their teams, and they can't do that without the foundation of trust and being open and honest and. Uh, and making it safe for people to try things, uh, to make mistakes. Now, actually, can I just go down that path for just a second? Yeah, please do. Please do. Uh, yeah. Um, so um, I worked at a company, I worked for Magma Copper Company, which uh, was written up in the literature as this uh, Wall Street darling, big transformation story. Uh, Harvard Business came, made a, made a movie uh, of, of some of the work that we were doing. It was a lot of fun, great place to work. Uh, but uh, um, something happened in one part of that organization uh, called the Tank House, and uh, employees had been taught to, that they were empowered, that they could try new things to improve productivity, and, and they did. And in one case, there was a frontline employee who, um, in the uh, Tank House, they had these big uh, tanks of acid, and they put copper in, in uh, plates in there, and and uh, they put electricity to it. And, uh, and so the copper ions swim across it, attached to another plate and it becomes more pure. And so that, that's sort of the overly simplistic version of how it works. But, but uh, he had a great idea. He thought, you know, th there's a cycle that a, a time that it takes for those little ions to, to swim across to the other and attach to the other plate. And so this process takes, uh, I don't remember, a couple of weeks or something. If we turned up the electricity, we could speed that process up. Maybe we could do it in half the time, right? And so he did that. He started turning up the electricity, <laughs> some of these units. Well, 
needless to say, it was a disaster. <laughs> it was an absolute disaster. Um, and um, when uh, when it was found out what had happened, he was called in to the tank house uh, superintendent. Who and he said he told the superintendent says, "Let's just get this over with quickly. I know I messed up. Just tell me I'm fired. Let me go home. You know, this is Aww. this is this is just a terrible day." Right? And so the superintendent said, no, 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 nobody's getting fired today. And he said, really? Why? How can that not? How can that be? I, I just cost the company, you know, millions of dollars or whatever. You like, know, just, I would have fired myself, right? right, right. <laughs> yeah. And superintendent said, no, let's let's have a conversation about this. And he talked to him. He said he commended he commended this guy for taking the effort, taking the initiative to try to make things better all on his own. Nobody had to coerce him or persuade him. He had a great idea or what seemed like a great idea and he went out and he did it he said that's what we want people to do you absolutely did the right thing now let's talk about how it could have turned out better and then they had a conversation about these this line of offices down from the superintendent filled with engineers and he said do you know what those guys do they spend all day long trying to figure out how to do this process better more efficient higher quality and so on they're pretty smart and uh, if you ever have an idea that, that you would like to try out, you should bounce it off somebody before you do it, right? Get, get additional heads involved. And these engineers would love to talk to you. And he said, you mean I could leave my work, my work and go into the office here and talk to those, those people? He said, absolutely. Oh my. You'd be welcome to come in there. So, um, and if you did that, they would have talked to you and maybe shaped it a little bit. And they might have said, well, let's do it by degrees, or maybe maybe we tried that, but maybe there's something else we can do. Maybe there's something to this idea we just need to work on a little bit. So he said, uh, so what I want you to go out of here with is the concept that you're not alone here. You've got a team of people to back you, to support you and help you to continue doing those, taking initiative and doing those things like you just did, only doing it with the help of others. How do you feel about that? And he says, oh, I'd, I'd love to do that. That would be great. I didn't realize there were all these resources and I could access them. And he said, yeah, you can access them. Absolutely. And he said, so what would you do different? If you had something, you could do this over again, what would you do? And he said, oh, I'd run into their offices. I'd talk to them in a heartbeat. And <laughs> find out before I turned any, any knobs. And he said, great. You know, that's, that's what we want to learn from it. Now, the lesson there is, is, is pretty powerful, right? If he had fired that individual, what do you think would have happened to the rest of the team when it came to ideas and, and opportunities to show initiative? Zero. Cut them off right. completely. Shut it down, yeah. right? Would have shut it down. Yeah. Instead, what do you think happened? The fact that he didn't get fired, he learned, he, uh, his capacity to contribute was increased. Yeah, so so then that would generate more ideas, and I bet they did figure out a way to reduce the time in that process. That, that group went on to set record after record in the industry month after month they were at the top of the, the uh, top of the industry yeah and i think wow. right and and so you can see the lesson from that how we manage uh mistakes how we make it safe for people to try new things to show initiative to go out and make a difference make a contribution uh you know makes all I, the difference. I, and doesn't it, it shows something else really interesting to me as well, Kevin, which is that there was this unwritten rule, right? That the the guys in the in the tank house don't go talk to the engineers. There's oh, like yeah. an invisible wall. They yep. maybe there was a visible wall. You do not cross that line. Yep. So there was a rule there. And so the opportunity for leadership was to say, hey, we don't work that way. We actually talk to each other. We're we're all here to help each other. And um the fact that the, the manager didn't know that, well, that was a lesson for the manager too, right? That the manager yeah. didn't realize about that this unwritten rule existed. Absolutely. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Because in your culture, you don't know what people, and you may be setting the tone, but you don't know what the, the things that are being said are being thought. So, yeah. It's a, it's, and yeah. there was a long history here too. I mean, there were seven unions, there was uh, oh, labor my. strife. And the company was about to go under. And so before this transformation started, um, the, the parties, the union and leaders, the uh, management wouldn't even meet. 
it was uh, in fact there was an explosion blew up a building on the side of the mountain and you know there's all kinds of things associated with it so it was a pretty <laughs> dramatic turnaround so that was there was history there too about yeah. who gets to talk to who exactly. wow and so even though you, you you like to tell people it's different now it takes some time before people experience the change in in all aspects of the work right and, and actually try it and find that it works, right? Because right, yeah. I could tell you, hey, it's fine to go talk to that person. But if they go walk in the office and say, hey, what are you doing here? Go right. away. You know, then you've blown the whole thing. Yeah. Kevin, what are you doing now? Yeah. So I have a consulting company. Uh, we used to do organization wide transformation and we've scaled it to, to really focus on leaders and their teams, mostly uh, smaller business units. Uh, but uh, but we do uh, kind of turnarounds there to help the help leaders to learn what it means to be a great leader. Uh, we have a program we call the 90 day turnaround and uh, helps uh, leaders to develop the leadership skills and in the process to actually turn around their teams in 90 days to, to create high levels of engagement and high wow. team performance. That's kind of awesome. And how do people find you, Kevin? Yeah, well, two places. One is the 90, uh, the 90 day turnaround.com uh, is one. And the other is uh, our website, which is ascentmanagement.com, which is more complicated than it sounds. <laughs> A-S-C-E-N-T-M-G-T.com. So management is shortened. Okay, thanks. Thanks. And, you, and you, are you also available on LinkedIn if people want to Absolutely. check um, you out there? Yep, yep. If you look for um, uh, look for me, Kevin Herring, I, I've got a I've got a site I post fairly regularly um, with uh, management leadership tips. Uh, but you can find me there, Kevin Herring uh, slash ninety day turnaround. Um, also, the company websites on their ascent management as well. Thank you. So, Kevin, what's your one piece of advice for a young person starting out? Uh, to me is um, always be learning and always be sharing. Uh, make, it your, make it your responsibility to build the capacity of those around you, especially your team. Uh, you know, your, make it your priority to teach them what you know, share with them what you've heard and learned and help them to be the best they can be and get the most meaning and purpose in their uh, lives at work. And if you do that, it'll, it'll build you, it'll build you as a leader. Wow. Thank you. Great advice. Hey, Kevin Harry, thank you so much for traveling with me to the edges of lean. Oh, thank you for having me. It was great. I enjoyed talking with you. This is Bella Engelbach, and I'd like to thank Kevin Herring for being my guest on the edges of lean. What keeps you engaged at work? How do you help others get and stay engaged? Would you like to learn more? We would love to hear from you. Find Kevin at ascentmanagement.com. That's A-S-C-E-N-T-M-G-T.com, where you can learn about the 90-day team performance turnaround and sign up for a free newsletter with great leadership tips and information. Or go to the 90-day turnaround.com. Find me on LinkedIn or at leanforhumans.com or comment wherever you watch or listen. Subscribe and tell a friend about the edges of lean. Please join me in exploring more of the edges of lean. There's a lot to learn. And check out my friends in the Lean Communicators community at leancommunicators.com. You'll find more podcasts and videos with lots of great new content every week. The Edges of Lean is written and produced by Bella Engelbach with support from Podcast Inc. This is a Lean for Humans production.